Hi, I'm Alan Hedblum. Welcome to our show, a place to feel like you belong. Today's guest, Juan Daniel Castro, was born in Mexico, but he originally had no intention of coming to the United States, leapfrogging over this country to attend high school in Canada. Eventually, he changed his mind, settled here, and is now an American citizen. Juan Daniel, welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Thank you. It's good to be here. Hi, Alan. You, as I just said in the introduction, were a student for uh, a while in Canada. While you were there, what did you learn? First, it was my um, induction to multicultural environments. I loved uh, the CN Tower, the museums. Uh, it was in Toronto. It, it was in Toronto. Yeah. So seeing uh, all, all sorts of people, uh, uh, a huge inf influx of uh, people coming from India at that point in time, I'm talking about uh, 85, just around that time. And uh, I just felt that uh, the city was meant to be for me. Little did I know uh, that wasn't the case. Because your hometown wasn't very diverse, right? It was very, very um, um, homogeneous, if you, if you will. Uh, we had uh, uh, pockets of... Uh, People from Germany, from uh, the Netherlands, surprisingly, uh, a lot of Spanish. Okay. Uh, but but yeah, for the most part, uh, the the population was made of mestizos like myself. Okay. And uh, uh, people from the original uh, nations of this hemisphere. Sure, sure. So what did what did living in Toronto for? You were there a year. Just just a little less than a year. Yeah. Okay. So what did it teach you? It, it made, made me realize that uh, there are other ways of thinking, that, uh, um, you know, that uh, music um, is a universal language. I, I confirm that. I, I've been always uh, uh, enamored with, with sounds and, mm -hmm. and uh, poems and so songwriting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I felt that it was... Uh, and a nice uh, way to, to shape to to uh, to shape who I am. Although those, in many ways, I call my formative years. Sure. So, in 1976, you got a visa to come to the United States. Nine, 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 say 86. Nine, uh, eight, eight, well, yeah. So in 1985, I, uh, I I flew to Toronto. Okay. From straight from Mexico City. Okay. And then uh, I I went back and you know did a bunch of schooling. Um, about uh, 1991, 92, uh, I, I went and applied for a U.S. visa and I was granted one. Yeah. yeah. What was your motivation? I figure uh, I will uh, sometime need to polish the little English I learned in, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I applied and um, yeah, I even spoke with the uh, uh, officer in English, and he's like, oh. <laughs> You're good to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, what was happening in Mexico at that time? So 1991, 92, oh, you know, they, they gave you visas back then for 10 years at a time, five to 10 years, depending on your ability to pay for the fee. So I, I, I got a 10-year visa. And so 1991, two, three, four, uh, went on eventful, five, six, 94, we have to remember, there was a huge uh, economic downturn in, in uh, Mexican economy. That's when the peso currency lost, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, things depreciated uh, in value uh, uh, as much as two times. So at that point, you know, I was already uh, gigging. I was already playing uh, to support my studies. And uh, I, I figured, you know, I... 
I can probably take a shot at being the leader of the band. And I went and bought some instruments. And um, when this happened, I, I realized that um, I owed more than, than, uh, than I had borrowed uh, because of the crisis. And you know, I'm going to keep you know, plugging away, making payments. And at some point, it was just unbearable. Uh, 1995, 96, uh, is when I when I called a friend who was here in Grand Rapids, and he uh, he said, well, "Well, why don't you just come visit?" And I came visit. Yeah. Now, when you first came, you were doing factory work, correct? Yes. So fast forward to uh, uh, say 1997, 98, I worked from a dishwasher to a, f a metal worker uh, at one of the factories here on 44th. Then I did uh, um, card, cardboard, uh, box, you know, I worked at a box factory. Okay. I worked at a, um, at a body shop. And then I found uh, a wonderful opportunity at Spectrum Health, and that's uh, where, where I am still since well, 1998. You, you discovered, or other people discovered, you had language skills. That was actually that was my intention uh, when when I applied. I was looking for an interpreter job, uh, but there there weren't any openings. Uh, I don't think they even had a, a a language service department, and if they did, it was very small. Maybe one or two people staffed it. So. Um, they said, well, yeah, it's nice that you're looking for that kind of a job, but these are the jobs available. Um, what do you think about uh, central supply technician? I was, I was there with suit and tie. And <laughs> the lady even complimented my tie. She's like, well, I've never seen a young man uh, applying for a job uh, on, on a suit and a tie. I was like, well, well, that's customary in Mexico. So I. You know, I went on with the uh, with the interview, and I said, "Yeah, I think I can do that job. Basically, uh, run up and down the hospital, uh, delivering equipment, uh, recovering uh, the soil uh, equipment, uh, instruments, so forth and so on." So I I, I seized the opportunity, and I'm still there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fast forward to now, you have a really interesting position working with Programa Puente. Can you tell us about that? Sure thing. So Programa Puente uh, started uh, back in 2000 as a response to the influx, uh, which I was a part of, right, uh, of Latino uh, well, Someone has to lead the charge, right? Coming into the area. And so uh, um, we realized that we had issues with uh, language barriers and um, culture, cultural aspects mm -hmm. of, you know, connecting with uh, people f from the uh, Latino community, primarily the Spanish speaking, because we have a Portuguese speaking community. Who are Latins of a, right. of a different stripe. Correct. So um, uh, my, my upline and I talked about many, many, uh, during many, many meetings uh, about the possibility of, of doing something, uh, of merging what, what she was doing at the time and, and what I was doing. And, and so Programa Puente came to life. Uh, we at the time did a lot of things that had to do with access to healthcare, and and with psychosocial inter interventions that uh, went from uh, simple things as uh, explaining um, your electric uh, bill, mm -hmm. um, how to apply for a job, and, and things of that nature. You know, just mm -hmm. uh, getting people acquainted with their new environment. That's mm -hmm. what we did uh, at the beginning. So now, uh, since 2013. We've uh, re-engineered the program mm -hmm. to, to make it uh, more of a uh, preventive uh, strategy, uh, educational one, right? Mm -hmm. Where we tell people that stayed for all these years, well, you stayed, you, you know, uh, in many ways achieved and, and moved your life forward in, in, in this. Uh, you know, economically, in this, yeah. right, yeah. socially. Correct. Uh, but, but we need to look at uh, how you've uh, adopted uh, things, um, um, ways of life that aren't really healthy. And, and, maybe, and maybe we can start looking at how to best tackle those and, and get you uh, back on a healthier and path. And we should, we should point out to our viewers that there is a large 
um, health uh, outcomes disparity in the United States between uh, white population and uh, the Latino population, between the white population and the uh, black population as well. That, that is correct, and uh, actually that's uh, our underlying assumption, no? where uh, we, we are all um, in, in many ways um, at risk of uh, having a cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. But with, with Latinos, uh, it, 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 it comes uh, to, to a greater risk because of the um, cultural and linguistic uh, considerations that need to be made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, I want to switch topics for a minute because people might not have guessed, just looking at you, but you hinted at it earlier, that you are a musician mm -hmm. and you are currently in a band. Los de Afuera, can you tell uh, us? Ah, yeah, Los de Afuera. So Los de Afuera is a salsa band. Okay. And Los de Afuera means the outsiders. Uh, I've traveled to Puerto Rico a couple of times. I always say that my host culture is, is really Puerto Rican. Uh, and, um, is so salsa originally Puerto Rican? Salsa has, that, that's a different story, but uh, salsa is, is originally from, from New York and, and it, it, it comes about because of uh, the contact of, of different uh, cultures, including Puerto Rican, Cuban, uh, Mexican, and, and you know, the living, rest, living Venezuela, and yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the Caribbean is known for, for that, uh, okay. for those rhythms, Afrontilian rhythms. Okay. And so when, um, when I visited the island, it was so uh, interesting to hear that a Puerto Rican would tell a fellow Puerto Rican, oh, so you're not from around. Uh, so, oh, mira para allá, este de afuera. He's from the outside, you know, it's like, they, that's what they call Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. <laughs> uh, los de afuera. And so, uh, um, what, three, uh, the majority of the band members are of uh, Puerto Rican uh, uh, descent. Okay. And that's why I figure, yeah, we are los de afuera. But then if you think about it uh, a little closer, all of, it, all of us in the band, including uh, somebody uh, who's African-American and myself and another uh, Mexican uh, co-national, we are all from the afuera. We're all from the outside. You mm -hmm. know, uh, some of us came here. Some of, some of us were brought against our will, and you know, uh, even the uh, the guy that uh, plays uh, trombone with us, he's a Michigander. You know, it's like okay. uh, I think he's uh, German or, or Irish descent. Yeah. It's like even he is from outside. You know, even even his roots are from. You know, not from here. It's immigrant commonalities. Right, right, right. So that's that's what we that's why we named that uh, band uh, Los de Afuera, and we're we're playing. Uh, um, we're getting busy this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at playing uh, at Park Theater again in Holland. Okay. And well, yeah. Awesome. What do, you else? Have, do you have a website? Uh, we have a Facebook page. Okay, we'll we'll yeah. share losdeafueramusic.com. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll share it on the screen for our that viewers. That would be great. Yeah. Sure. So uh, we need to wrap up in just a moment. Yes. But the United States, some aspects of it work for you, some aspects less so. Can you tell us just thirty seconds on each? What works? What doesn't? I, I love the fact that uh, uh, communities here are uh, well planned and thought of. Uh, I, I have a, a visual impairment, so I don't drive. And I, you know, even though uh, where I come from has uh, a, a, a greater uh, network of, of transportation systems. Buses. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, living here is, is, is just easier because of the considerations and because of the uh, American Disability Act. Uh, ADA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So that's, that's what works. Okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that there are things don't work, I, you know, I, I think I see some challenges still after, you know, 18 years or so of being here in, in communicating, you know? Okay. Because some, sometimes uh, the tone isn't right, my accent uh, is too thick, uh, little, you know, things of that uh, nature mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, kind of get in the way, but other than that, I. I've had a very positive experience here in awesome. Grand Rapids. And I'd like to think that people usually vote with their feet. And so the fact that your feet have stayed in West Michigan means yes. it, it must be working for absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, Daniel, I want to thank you so much for coming by the show and, uh, and talking with, with us today. It was quite a pleasure.
Yeah, you bet. So. And for our viewers, we'd like you to stick around. We'll be back shortly with some tips on American English, American culture, and even a little humor. Verte sonreír Es despertar a medianoche Ante un menguante De la luna que promete Otro mañana Para mí Verte sonreír Despierta en mi alma la alegría de vivir Es mi bendición Verte sonreír These cubicles are too noisy. My co-workers never do their share of the work. Our customers are too demanding. My office mate is so messy. Does this sound familiar? Well, if you work in a company, large or small, one constant factor is complaining. When coworkers start grousing, we often want to just walk away, but that may not be possible when we work in teams. If you tell someone to stop being such a whiner, it might sound like you think you're better than they are. Some experts say it's better to try to be friendly with coworkers and set an example of not griping yourself. If you become known as the positive person at the office, the negative people may eventually respond better to you. So, why is it important to stay positive in the workplace? Research shows that complainers can damage productivity. If we are exposed to constant negativity, this atmosphere can interfere with learning, memory, attention, and even our judgment. Some bosses have implemented programs to reduce workplace grousing by offering cash rewards to employees who resist grumbling or gossiping for at least a week. Why is it hard to avoid grumbling? Well, according to a Gallup poll of over 30,000 U.S. employees, about one-fifth of us feel disengaged or are negative or are likely to complain about their employers. All this negativity not only harms productivity, but it also increases absenteeism and increases quality defects, according to the research. Some experts suggest we take a solutions-oriented approach to cope with complainers. For example, when somebody beefs about the boss, you could say, hmm, sounds like you and he have something to talk about. The complainer will either have to shut up or take your message seriously and make an appointment to talk with the boss. If someone is belly aching just to get attention, you might change the topic by asking, what's going well for you? The complainer might look at you like you're crazy, but eventually she will either switch topics or stop talking to you. In any case, you won't have to listen to her anymore. And of course, some conflict in the workplace is healthy. Experts say that a ratio of three to one positive interactions to negative interactions is a good way to keep performance high. So, to summarize, here are five tips to keep complainers from driving you crazy. Number one, change the subject. Maybe you can ask the complainer what's going well. Number two, if you're stuck listening, retreat to an imaginary peaceful place that you enjoy. Number three, ask the complainer, what do you intend to do about the problem? Number four, move your desk or workstation farther from the grumblers who never stop. And number five, in meetings, schedule a specific but limited amount of time for everyone to constructively voice their complaints. <laughs> <laughs> A 
mafia hitman was arrested for killing a man in a rice field with a porcelain figurine. The police said this was the first known case of a knick-knack paddywhack.